hello. What a friendly group. Um, so I am the only thing that is standing between you and one of Zachary's cookies. <laughs> so hopefully it will be an enjoyable interlude before you go to that, which will definitely be enjoyable. So I'm going to talk about hotel design today. And hotels have been a part of the Broadway experience ever since Broadway became Broadway. And what I thought was kind of interesting when I was thinking about what I might speak about here was that in a time when a lot of industries are becoming more about an online experience and less about a physical experience, both hotels and Broadway are still rooted in that physical experience. And what you may not know is that over the last 15 years, the design and the experience of the hotel lobby has been completely reinvented. So to understand how this happened, I'm going to give you a brief history of hotel design, which I'm sure all of you were coming here and thinking, oh, please, <laughs> let it be. Let it be hotel design that I learn about today. All right. So. Had you been traveling any time before the middle of the 19th century, you would have been staying someplace like this, <laughs> at an inn or a tavern with a few rooms to rent. And you would have arrived on horseback or maybe, as you see here, by stagecoach. Now, this all changes with the Industrial Revolution and the railroads. So people are traveling by rail, and they need a different kind of accommodation. And this really leads to the modern hotel as we know it today. And a couple of examples that opened right around the time the Broadway Theater District is born is the Algonquin and the St. Regis. And as we go from the 19th century and into the 20th century, hotels introduce a number of improvements in technology, like electric lighting, telephones, elevators, television, and even 1-800 numbers for reservations. But nothing fundamentally changes in the approach to the design of the hotel lobby. That is, until the 1980s. When Ian Schrager, who is the gentleman here, and his partner, Steve Rubell, leveraged their experience running legendary nightclubs like Studio 54 and the Palladium, and they create the concept of the boutique hotel. They start with Morgan's, followed by the Royalton and the Paramount. Steve Rubell dies in 1989, but Ian Schrager continues and opens other iconic properties like the Mondrian, Hudson, and the Delano. Now, it's a little hard to remember this looking at it now, but the design of these hotels was revolutionary. Philippe Stark created fantasy environments that attracted celebrities and other people who just wanted to be at the hippest spot in town, which was now the boutique hotel lobby. So it takes a few years for the rest of the hotel industry to really catch on to Ian Schrager's ideas. But as we move into the end of the 20th century, there are other trends that are forcing the hotel industry to change technology. People are no longer traveling on business or leisure. Because of technology, and they're connected all the time, they're traveling on leisure. <laughs> leisure. Um, so they're adding leisure activities to a business trip, and they're doing what everybody does now. You're checking in with work while you're supposed to be on vacation. So globalization meant that more people, now more connected because of digital technology, are traveling to and from more places. And the democratization of design, or you could call it the target effect, um, means that guests are de demanding innovation and design in every category of lodging, not just boutique hotels. W Hotels brand launches in 1998 with a lobby called The Living Room. And this was really the first 21st century hotel brand with a very different idea about what happened in the lobby. Now, it was influenced by the boutique hotels, but also, also by lifestyle trends and technology. So we've just covered about 
150 years of history, if I'm, if I'm on track with my uh, talk here. Um, so to understand the magnitude of the change that occurred, let's review. Yes, you all want to check in here, right? But, you know, I mean, we can, we can laugh about it, and yes, I picked a funny picture, but, you know, this is really not that much of an exaggeration. This really was the model not too long ago. The lobby was a transactional space. It was where you checked in, you checked out, you know, maybe you met some people there, but then you left. People were not spending their time in the lobby. So hotel lobbies today are very different. They're designed to offer guests a sequence of branded experiences using sound, lighting, decor, programming from when guests check in, during their stay, and when they check out. Hotel lobbies today have multiple options for meeting and working, dining, shopping, and relaxing. Connectivity is expected. Spaces have to be flexible, and users are both guest and local. And every point of contact with your guest is an opportunity to build and reinforce your brand through storytelling and design. So let's come back to Broadway. It seems to me that there's an opportunity to take the storytelling and design that happens on stage, what Broadway does best, and use it to transform the experience of the theater lobby and public spaces. And if you look at the evolution of hotel design, I think you'll agree, the hotel industry has taken a lot of inspiration from theatrical design. From the arrival experience at the marquee to the theater lobby and beyond, transactional functional spaces could be transformed into touch points for the Broadway brand. Even the bathrooms. Because I know, it, it seems so basic, but if you can improve this experience, I think you open up a lot of other opportunities to drive loyalty and revenue. Food, beverage, and retail are other areas that could be reinvented for Broadway as they have been for hotels. Now, one of the things I talked about at the beginning was the fact that both uh, Broadway and hotels take place in a physical space, a building. And I think that this is a real asset for Broadway because historic buildings, and I know that not all theaters are historic, but there are quite a few that are, um, but historic buildings have a built-in narrative that, and an emotional connection that people are drawn to. And in a time when nothing seems permanent or made to last, this is a real connection that you can have with your audience. And if the hotel example is any kind of, here are my slides of my historic hotels, or historic um, theaters, and if the hotel example is anything to go by, historic structures are very attractive to the Gen Y and millennial demographic. And I know there are a lot of you here today, so at the break I'd love to hear if you think that this is a valid point. But anybody here who's been at the, to the Ace Hotel in New York, you, you know what I'm talking about, right? So I'm not saying that any of this is easy. Um, in the hotel industry, the lobby and public spaces continue to evolve and changing the design of physical space takes time, vision, and investment. But we don't think we have a choice. If we're gonna keep driving revenue and loyalty for our brands, we have to keep thinking about and reinventing the lobby experience that we're offering our guests. And in a similar way, if Broadway were to reinvent their public spaces and lobbies, that would require a lot of investment and also would have some challenges. But I really think it has a lot of opportunities. And if you look at the hotels that are just down the block, I think that they may have some useful les lessons to share. So if you take what Broadway does best, the stagecraft and storytelling and design that happens on stage and use it to reinvent a theater experience that gives your audience touch points throughout their visit, I think you'll have something really unique and compelling. 
an experience where the show really starts at the door. Thank you. Thank you.